Zoom. I'm personally quite excited about this presentation. It's the first time we have a presentation on Julia at Force4G. So I hope this is just the beginning of something that can grow to be another way to use Force4G, another way that we can use open data. So Martin Fisser and Martin Pronk will introduce us to Julia. Good luck. There you go. Thank you. We're also quite excited to present here for the first time at Phos4G. Uh, we presented before on JuliaCon last year, um, but uh, that's kind of preaching to the choir. Now for the first time, it's nice to uh, present to the wider geospatial community. Um, so I wonder, uh, show of hands please, like who knows what Julia is, who has heard about it? Okay, that, that looks very good. Who has actually installed it and given it a try, even if it was just, ah, also quite a few. Uh, well, um, so we're going to present uh, about Julia Geo. Uh, Julia Geo, it's a GitHub organization where uh, uh, a bunch of us work together uh, on creating packages uh, that make uh, uh, it easier to use Julia for geospatial applications. Um, uh, we're not only going to talk about packages that are strictly inside this GitHub repository, but you know, in in a, in a wider sense as well. Um, so, first off, let's introduce ourselves. We are who are we? Uh, Martijn and Maarten. We are not the same person, <laughs> even. Though, um, Touch names. <laughs> yeah. Touch names. Um, so we work both at uh, Deltares, but. You know, I just want to be clear, like, um, uh, yeah, I, I will explain a bit, like, uh, how we came to it and, and uh, how we are using it at Altadis. But in this sense, we are presenting it more from the community, from the, the wider group of people that, that develop these, uh, these packages. Um, personally, I'm a hydrologist, and Marta uh, uh, is more from a geoinformatics background. And those are GitHub handles. So context, um, basically uh, at Deltares, I'm guilty of like being the first one to introduce Julia within projects. And that project was about processing point clouds. And it was uh, clear very early on that uh, existing software wouldn't uh, work for us because we had a very clear idea that we wanted to do our own kind of algorithms that work on a point-by-point -point level. Uh, myself, I'm mostly familiar with uh, Python. I program in Python a lot, I enjoy it. But for this application, if you really need to iterate over, over points, like billions of points, it, it's really hard to scale it. Uh, of course, there are some, some solutions like, like Numba or, or Cyton, um, but you know, they, they don't um, it quite, yeah, it, it's, it's also difficult. So and, and there was basically either I could start prototyping it in Python, get something together quite quickly, but I knew it would be slow to run. Um, I, I don't know how to program C++ myself, like many people that come from an earth science uh, background. Um, uh, so I would have to, then if I'm done prototyping, ask somebody, to, to make it fast, basically. And, and the, the idea of Julia is that it solves this two-language problem, so to say. Uh, and the the, the fund fundamental thing they, they state is there's no need for there to be a separation between uh, uh, fast to implement and fast to run. So um, it's a dynamic language. Uh, it's general purpose, but it was specifically designed to be good at uh, scientific and numerical computing. Um, and it, it does that by compiling functions to native code, so it runs in a speed similar to, to C. Uh, version 1.0, so the, the first stable release, was only released last year, but um, I think now, since a week ago, it's already been 10 years since the first commit of, of Julia started, and it started at MIT. Um, uh, so, it's, so it's an open source uh, uh, effort. It's licensed under the MIT license, similar to GDO itself. 
Um, and uh, so the ecosystem of packages, now that the language is stable, uh, the, the, the packages are, are themselves still evolving and getting better all the time. So what does it look like? Um, just a small slide of, of some syntax, uh, just to show you like it's not some kind of scary syntax. Those familiar with MATLAB, Python syntax might recognize a couple of things. This is how we print uh, things. Um, as you see here in the uh, VFA, this is a two-dimensional array. Um, so we talk about types a lot. But the nice thing about UDI is that it, does, it doesn't force you to talk about types at all. So uh, you can leave out like, OK, I don't care what type this N is. And it will just compile uh, uh, on the fly for the right types. Um, and yeah, so one step back, more about the, the, the interest uh, for using Julia in, in, in the geosciences. So of, of course, there's always, we have a lot of public uh, uh, channels. Uh, this is from the old uh, mailing list. Now we're on this course. Um, from 2014, back then, uh, email from Fabian Hans from uh, Germany, uh, uh, just asking people like, hey, you know, who else is interested in, in using Julia for this? And can we maybe get together and, and get, get a bit organized? Uh, so this got the ball a little bit running. And I think half a year later, we started this Julia Geo uh, GitHub organization. Um, so first discussions like, OK, you know, let's make Julia nice for this, what, what should we do? Um, and I think a lot of us agreed from the start is that, you know, to get uh, to a useful kind of level, um, we need to uh, just start wrapping the, the big OSGEO uh, projects like, like GDAL, GEOS, Proj, NetCDF. Oh, that's not OSGEO, but... Um, because there's a lot of very useful functionality already implemented. We can try to implement that ourselves, uh, but, but why? It will take a very long time uh, before we can be nearly as productive. Um, and at the same time, for those who for some reason uh, uh, cannot or don't want to rely on, on binary dependencies, uh, people are working on, on, on native packages. Um, uh, yeah. OK, thank you, Martijn. Um, so what can we do now at the moment with GDR Geo? Um, for that, I'm going to switch to a Jupyter-like notebook. Um, so here, basically. Um, and I think one of the main nice things about Julia is that you have a built-in package manager. So if you, in the Julia uh, environment, if you do the bracket and say add project 4, it will download project 4, the Julia library, but it also will download uh, a pre-compiled library for you. Depending on which operating system you're in, it will work on Mac, it will work on Linux and Windows. So it's basically at the library and you can start using it just afterwards. No hard installation things. Uh, you can look up documentation about the projections that are actually in there. Um, we can define two common projections and eventually transform a coordinate between those two projections. And it will, in a few lines of code, you basically have everything working. Um, if we go back, and this also works for GDAL, this works for GEOS, this works for NetCDF, so not more spending days on getting GDAL to work on Windows uh, in Python. It, this should work out of the box. Um, of course, I'm omitting many packages here now, so please take a look at the GitHub uh, repository uh, and see if you recognize some packages there that you could use. So let's talk about what's nearly there, what we're working on now. These are open uh, pull requests and they're being reviewed. Um, so as, as we've seen before in the uh, Opera House next door, we have the Project 6 going on, GDAL 3 releases. Um, and these need to be wrapped. There are new interfaces there. It needs to be tested for us. Um, so I can also show you that. If I go back now, 
Uh, by the way, this is a public notebook. You can find the link later. In the package manager in Julia, you can also install a Git branch. It's basically a Git package manager. So here we add with the, the RAP6 version, we install another branch, which actually gets you the latest project version. Um, basically, exactly works the same. Again, start using it, and here you can see that we uh, use the new interface, project create, to actually create a projection. So this is a new interface. Uh, and secondly, we, for example, we produce the WKT2 uh, version of this projection. And this works pretty well already. Uh, and later on, we want to make this wrapping a bit uh, more convenient, more Julia because in the C library, there is no optional arguments or keyword arguments, so we'll put uh, those in ourselves. Uh, for the rest, all the wrapping is basically automatic. So GDAL, we didn't produce that much code ourselves, it's just wrapping all the C libraries. Um, uh, so this will be in the next release of these Julia packages, so probably in a month or so. So, but then from then on, from a month later, uh, talking about a year now, um, where do we want to go with the Julia Geo ecosystem? Uh, we have a stable language now, and now we want to find out what we can actually uh, do with it, so make use of the language itself. I think first we need some better high-level documentation that you can actually, one site where you can find all the spatial packages so you don't get lost. Uh, we can make some more Julian packages uh, because wrappers are nice, but they're very C-like. Uh, we can add more GDAL drivers. There's a lot of drivers out there, more added every day. And I think uh, on a high level side, plotting, things like data cubes and, and more of those uh, <laughs> hypercubes would be nice to have, and, which is something we're working on, but it hasn't crystallized yet, I would say. Um, now I want to talk about one strong thing about the Julia language. Uh, which is the def definition of common interfaces. Uh, and to explain this, I will make use of the tables.gl uh, package in Julia. So nothing geospatial just yet. It's just uh, a definition of how tables, uh, which operation should be defined on a table. Um, I can demo this as well. So here we install in Julia, the CSV package, the data frames package, and the type tables package. These are three different definitions of what a table is. And you can imagine that one is very generic and high level and easy to use, one is more used for speed, and another one is just for a very specific table, a table type thing. So there will always be different types of one base thing. But the nice thing is, in the tables.gl package, we defined what a table um, how you can talk to a table and what you should get back. So basically, how to get it in and out. So if you look at this, we create a CSV, just string, and we read it in as a CSV, and now you get a CSV type. But then you say, use data frames, and just say to the data frame, now load that CSV that we just created. And now it's a data frame. And this may, you can also do this in Python, but now you need both packages to work together and know of each other and start uh, subclassing things. And uh, well, you need to know a lot. Uh, and you can actually go on and say using type tables and now use that data frame as a type table. And now you have another type already. So it's very easy to come up with your own type, define a few common operations on your own type, and now it's understood by the complete ecosystem. You can, you can imagine that if you start doing this for geospatial related stuff, that would be wonderful. So you can introduce your own point type. We all differ about what a point should be. Should it be a C point or two geos? Uh, is it adjacent thing? Is it an, just an array without labels? If they just define some common operations on them, we can use your own point type or polygon or raster across the whole language and then you can really get your iteration speed in terms of development going. Um, and we hope to include all the geo-related stuff with the different ecosystems that there are already. So images, geometry, and the data environments. Okay. 
thank you. Uh, but before you clap, I want to thank all the other contribu uh, contributors to the Julia Geo ecosystem. We've put up the GitHub handles here. There are many more people who contributed. You know who you are. Um, and please, join us on Julia Geo. See if you like something, make pull requests, issues, and we're happy to help. Thanks. So, questions? Yes, I will come to you and give you the mic. Right. Are there any downsides to using Yulia? <laughs> uh, oh, difficult question. Probably not. Um, <laughs> no, I'd say it's mainly the ecosystem now. So we have these packages and they're still young. We're still trying to crystallize how the, so, such a common interface would look like. Uh, and if you would search for your specific use case, you probably can find the package. And if you can't, you really have to write your own. So it's a factor still smaller than the Python ecosystem, for example. But uh, I would say, come join us. And okay. Um, one maybe one thing to add to that, because a lot of people saying, yeah, Julia is fast, and, and then they try it, and then the first time they call a function, for instance, they're like, hmm, this is not that fast. But uh, so, so how it works, what happens is the first time you run a function, it uh, looks at the types and it compiles the code that is necessary. And the second time you call it, and that code is already created, so it will be fast. Um, and, the, the, and the core developers, who now formed their own uh, company, uh, uh, Julia Computing it's called, uh, and they have this now as the highest priority to, to make the latency or reduce the latency and make the compilation faster. If I'm right, it's also possible to just import Python models in Julia. So what about Shapely and all this stuff? It's easy to just import, but then you don't have this um, performance um, improvements, I think. Uh, yeah, good question. Um, so th and there's a pycall.jl uh, that allows a good interop between Julia and Python. Um, and one of the first main use cases, for instance, it's a lot of work to create a good plotting package. Look at modplotlib, uh, for instance. So uh, and the author, uh, um, Stephen Johnson, MIT professor, uh, created a pyplot to just make call <laughs> the Python modplotlib and, and save a lot of work like that. Um, in the case of Shapely, uh, I haven't tried it, but it should just work uh, just fine. Except that Shapely is, of course, a wrapper for Geos, and we already wrap Geos directly. So it, uh, I don't think it would make much sense to go through Python to Geos um, when we can go directly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, indeed. So, so you use some, some, you lose some performance. Um, uh, indeed, that, that is just hard to overcome because of how dynamic Python is, uh, basically. Yeah. So, uh, so uh, I don't really know the language, so I, and I'm more wondering what is the story about the uh, interop, the foreign function interface? Like, are there any tools to import C headers? Because you said that uh, wrapping is more or less automatic. And uh, also, can you export functions to C code if, in, just in case anyone wants to do that? And uh, also the same question for C++, because that's usually problematic. So the, uh, the, the thing for foreign function interface, that's the easiest. Um, so there, and there's a function called C call in, in Julia. And then you can directly call C functions from shared library. This is what we use mo uh, mainly. Um, except the code and that calls all these uh, C calls. This is generated automatically by a package called clang.jl, so that uses a compiler to figure out, oh, like, I see these functions are available. And uh, we then only do some post-processing. So for instance, we take like the, the doxygen.xml from, from the, the GDAL uh, repository, and we actually like, look up all the documentation and add it automatically. Uh, for um, 
ex it's also possible to to export um, uh, to uh, to C functions basically. Um, you could have a look at package compiler that .jl for that. Um, and for C++, uh, there's actually this really interesting package called cxx.jl that basically allows you to directly call C++ from Julia. Uh, and also cxx wrap that, that uh, allows kind of like in a boost Python kind of matter to, to uh, define this interface. Uh, but I haven't used the cxx uh, interface myself yet. Other questions? Anyone else? Okay, thank you, Martijn. Thank you, Martin.